Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Tom Khalil. Uh, I work for the White House National Economic Council uh, and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, we have a great set of panelists uh, here with us uh, this afternoon representing uh, academia, uh, startup, and, and a larger company. Um, and one of the themes that we're going to be talking about is uh, the democratization and decentralization of, of innovation. And so I'm going to kick things off by talking a little bit about uh, why uh, President Obama had a 18-foot uh, robotic giraffe from Burning Man on the south lawn of, of the White House, uh, which is that, uh, which I, I think is sort of an interesting uh, case study of the phenomena that we're going to be talking about, which is uh, last year, uh, the president had the first ever uh, Maker Faire uh, at the White House. How many people here in the audience have been to a Maker Faire? Um, so uh, the, the one in uh, Northern California, I think, attracts over 120,000, 130,000 people at this point. Um, and as you know, it's really the uh, convergence of, of a couple different phenomena that are occurring. One is that uh, a cultural phenomena, you have a growing number of people who are interested in being producers of things, not just consumers of things. Um, second, the tools that are necessary to design and make things uh, are becoming uh, lower cost, uh, easier to use, and, and more accessible, uh, because now in many instances, for example, for the cost of a, a gym membership, uh, you can uh, join a tech shop and get access to a million dollars worth of machine tools and the, the skills needed to use them. Um, and uh, so, uh, and then you have more and more mainstream organizations that are beginning to embrace this as well. So MIT has decided that if you want to, uh, if, if you're applying to MIT, you can send not only your GPA and your SAT score, but you can send your maker portfolio. Uh, Case Western Reserve University um, is investing in a 50,000 square foot facility called a Think Box, uh, which will have uh, coffee on the ground floor, design prototyping and fabrication spaces on, on the middle floors, and an accelerator on the top floor. Um, the, uh, Brian Krasanich, the CEO of Intel, flew all the way over to the uh, Rome Maker Fair uh, to announce uh, the set of open source development boards that were really uh, targeted towards the uh, maker community based on uh, Arduino technologies. Um, so the reason that the uh, president decided to have uh, a maker fair at the White House is that, um, number one, uh, we think that the maker movement advances values and dispositions that are worthwhile in themselves. So things like creativity and tinkering and uh, self-efficacy uh, these are all mindsets that I think participation in the maker movement helps to advance. Um, and uh, one of the things, for example, that uh, uh, Steve Jobs said is that um, it was his ability to mess around with a uh, Heath kit uh, that, uh, as, a, as a kid, that allowed him to recognize that the complex objects that he saw in his environment didn't appear there by magic. Uh, but if you were willing to devote the time and energy, you could, you could figure out how they were made. And that obviously had a, had a big impact on him. And he and Steve Wozniak uh, participated in something that was the 1970s version of the maker movement, which was the Homebrew Computer Club, uh, which is where they first uh, demonstrated the Apple uh, One uh, computer, which is, as you know today, depending on the st stock market, is one of the most uh, valuable companies in, in the world. So that's one reason why the president is focused on this. The second is that we think it has the potential to get more young boys and girls excited about STEM, excited about advanced manufacturing, and excited about design. Uh, and also to uh, counteract one of the really pernicious things that, that it happens in schools, which is that as you look um, at the level of student engagement, it steadily declines from primary to middle to high school, uh, so that by the time kids to go to high school, many of them report that they are bored a large fraction of the time. And you do not have to have a PhD in cognitive science to recognize that students are probably not going to be learning a whole lot 
if they're bored. Um, and so what some universities, so what some schools are beginning to do, uh, like a school in uh, western Pennsylvania, in, in rural Pennsylvania, they've created something called the Dream Factory uh, that allows students to work on projects that cut across computer science, the arts, career and technical education, and that are directly related to things that the students are passionate about or that help solve a real world problem. Um, so one of the things that we would like to see is to have every child uh, have the opportunity to, to be a maker and to design and make something that is, is personally meaningful to them. Um, and the third reason that we're excited about this is that if, um, uh, whether it will lower the barriers to innovation uh, in, the, uh, in the physical world in the same way that uh, open source software and cloud computing have lowered the barriers to innovation in the digital world uh, so that in, you know, it, uh, it's uh, a, a phenomenon that we see all the time is uh, a small group of people living on ramen noodles for several months uh, and because they don't have to go out and purchase millions of dollars of hardware and software, uh, they can uh, put uh, a cloud service on their credit card, uh, develop a minimum viable product, and begin to get feedback from customers about whether the online service or app that they have proposed is something that uh, there's any demand for. Um, and so the question is whether the, some of the forces are aligning to have that same sort of phenomena happen not only in the, uh, in the digital world but in the physical world. So you could imagine a situation where someone has an idea, uh, they go to a tech shop or a fab lab or a makerspace, they develop a prototype of that, uh, then they go to a crowdfunding platform like uh, Indiegogo or Kickstarter and uh, raise the money and the sort of pre-orders that they would need to go out and actually have that product uh, manufactured. Uh, so uh, I think this phenomena, this uh, phenomena of the decentralization and democratization of innovation is a really powerful one and, and one that uh, DARPA has been thinking about. Um, I think one of the things that it will require is for, uh, to think about not only scientific and technological innovation, but institutional innovation. Um, and let me give you one example of what I mean by that. So. Um, DARPA was interested in being able to reach out to a broader community, um, and so they developed something called the Fast Track Initiative, which allowed them to provide small contracts to individuals, some of whom were not even incorporated as a small business, uh, and be able to do that, both the source selection and the contracting in two weeks, uh, and, and do it in a, in a way that had low transaction costs, both for DARPA and for the performers. And, 90% of the people had never done business with, uh, with the federal government before. Uh, so I think that when you do do, uh, when you democratize the innovation, um, it, we also have to think about how the, does the government interact with a set of performers that may not be affiliated with, uh, with universities or, or, or even with uh, companies. Um, so uh, those are some of the, the trends that we're gonna be talking about is the uh, the role uh, of, of these trends in, in uh, uh, democratizing uh, innovation. Um, and uh, as I said, we have three uh, great speakers who are each gonna give 10-minute uh, uh, presentations uh, to provide an overview of, of the work uh, that they do. And, uh, and then I'm gonna uh, drill them for about half an hour and ask them some really uh, hard and uncomfortable questions. Um, so, uh, so the th uh, three speakers are uh, Prabal Dutta, who's a, a professor of uh, electrical engineering and computer science at University of Michigan. Uh, and I first met Prabal uh, when he was uh, getting his uh, PhD at uh, UC Berkeley, go Bears. Um, the, uh, and so he'll, he'll be talking about the, the work that he's been doing in areas like uh, smart dust. Uh, then we have uh, Andreas Olofsson, who is the founder of Adaptiva, um, uh, which is a company that can uh, boast a couple of firsts. The, uh, the first is uh, developing a, uh, a chip that can do uh, 50 gig flops a watt. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, also, you know, I mentioned crowdfunding and uh, 
and, and Adaptiva is the first company to ever do a successful uh, crowdfunding campaign. So hopefully you can tell us a little bit about that. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Nigel Paver, who's the Vice President of Engineering for ARM Research and is responsible for uh, driving uh, research programs in, uh, in areas such as uh, silicon technology, sensors, uh, IT architectures, and, and high-performance computing. So uh, we're going to have a perspective on, on issues ar around uh, innovation in uh, circuit technologies, both from the point of view of, of academia, of uh, startups, and, and of uh, larger firms that are involved in really building a, a large and robust uh, innovation ecosystem. So, Prabal, why don't you kick us off? Thanks. So, uh, Tom, you don't remember this, but uh, uh, we actually met a decade ago when I took your nanotech class in <laughs> Berkeley. <laughs> so it's great. To, we're, we're not quite there yet. But uh, anyway, I want to share with you today a story uh, that my colleagues and I uh, have been living, uh, trying to realize the vision of smart dust, of cubic millimeter scale computing. And let's start more than a half century ago when physicist Richard Feynman implored us to think small, right? Not think big, but think small. And he noted that there was plenty of room at the bottom, that we could shrink things considerably. And you fast forward 40 years from then, I happened to stumble across a paper by Berkeley professors Kahn, Katz, and Piester about smart dust, and that really excited me. And it turned out that this paper they wrote was really trying to get folks like me, systems people, interested in this area. And they articulated a handful of research problems, and smart dust was right around the corner. The real story here, though, is that computing shrinks by 100x every decade. It's pretty remarkable. So by 2010, you would think that you'd have smart dust all around us. Not quite there yet. Now, the underlying forces are, of course, Moore's law. Every time we shrink computers by 100x, we enable an entirely new application space. And for me, uh, there we go. Uh, so for me, the wait what moment, though, is when I graduated in 2010, I didn't see smart dust. I'll, I'll try this. Uh, and rather what happened when I was a freshly minted PhD, well, maybe I'll try sitting down, see if we can get this to work. Um, so when I was a freshly minted PhD, uh, we still didn't have smart dust. We had things that were about 100 times larger than that. I got to Michigan, and I noticed that my colleagues, David Blau and Dennis Sylvester, were building things closer to that. Not quite there, but they were monolithic systems. Now, when you looked around, a lot of people were working on the right components. We had a lot of millimeter scale components, but we had relatively few complete systems, right? The components weren't coming together. And this was frustrating because I wanted to use this stuff. I thought it was great. I worked on the software and the networking, but the actual stuff wasn't there. And so I started digging into what happened. Why weren't we seeing these systems emerging out of academic labs? And the reason was that we didn't have the right interconnect to bring the various pieces together. People were building components, but we weren't building systems because we couldn't connect them together. And the students would, of course, graduate once they built their component. Um, so is there a? All right, so we'll see. Maybe there's some feedback here. Uh, so anyway. Um, I don't know if we have any control over this or not. Um, I'll keep going. I think my time's clicking away. So uh, what we ended up doing was realizing that we needed All right. two different things. Are you ready? Ready? All 
All right. So um, what we observed was that we really weren't we're missing the interconnect that would allow us to tie all of these different components together that really respected the needs of millimeter scale systems, i.e. extremely low power, um, that we could have anything wake anything else up, that we didn't use an arbitrary number of I.O. lines. And so we ended up building a bus that was really more suited to this regime. We called it M-Bus. Uh, and we built a half a dozen or a dozen, a half a dozen systems, a dozen components out of this at Michigan. And I just want to tell you a little bit more about that story. So to put this into context, previously when you had systems that got built, uh, for example, a temperature sensor, and you wanted to build the next system, oftentimes these were monolithic. And they would take years, for example, three years to go from the temperature to the pressure sensor. That really wasn't so great. So what we in, in sort of envisioned was a modular set of components you could stitch together. And we achieved that. And so using this modular approach, we were able to go from three years down to three months. So you know, 10x improvement in getting systems out the door. And the key to making this happen was recognizing that the particular interconnect had to respect the fact that as these nodes got smaller, they had less energy, and so communications energy mattered a great deal. Uh, not only that, their surface area to interconnect these components were quite limited. That mattered a great deal. Uh, you had to pay attention to that. And the existing buses in industry, SPI and I2C, really weren't, uh, weren't paying attention to these kind of things. And they exist on pretty much every microcontroller, but they're inappropriate at the millimeter scale. So, for example, SPI requires two I.O. lines for every component that you want to integrate in your system. When you're building things at the millimeter scale and you don't know how many components you might need in your system, this is a bit of a non-starter. Similarly, I2C has a power budget that would completely dominate the active power budget of a millimeter scale system. It didn't make a lot of sense. Not very well Amdahl balanced. And so, MBUS tries to address these problems. It uses a ring topology. There's a fixed number of I.O. lines that are coming in and out of any particular bus. It's extremely low power. And adding additional components is really as easy as stitching something else into this ring. And so we're able to do this. So the, you have the same number of I.O. lines. It's extremely low power. And it doesn't suffer from the problem, for example, that SPI suffers from. It's also extremely low power so it doesn't suffer from the problems that I2C. So we finally have a bus that is energy balanced with computation, so computation and communication cost about the same. So the story here about the openness part of this is that the specification for this bus is completely open. Verilog implementing this bus is completely open. And you can go and download it after a click-through license. And what we're hoping is that the community, the larger community, will be able to take this technology and will be able to integrate it into their, uh, into their various systems. And we have then a larger ecosystem of components that we can pull from and go build those crazy applications we thought of 20 years ago without having to wait for market forces to conspire to enable this. That means we can move the science forward by five or 10 years. We can go explore what actually makes sense before we wait for somebody to figure out, ah, there's a business model here that justifies it. So components is not enough, right? We need full systems. And we've got enough stuff at Michigan now. If you look at this figure, we can put together things like pressure sensors and temperature sensors and imagers, complete computing systems that harvest energy from the environment. They're roughly a millimeter or two, cubic millimeter or two in volume. From just stitching together these blocks. And if there's a block that's missing, a sensor, a processor, we can add it with very little additional sort of incremental uh, investment. And so the story here is building this ecosystem and trying to grow it. The ecosystem now exists in Michigan. It exists in a couple of places elsewhere. And we'd like to see broader adoption. So the other piece, of course, is not everything is going to come from uh, from custom silicon on day one. And we'll need to integrate 
off-the-shelf technology with the custom technology. And so we've demonstrated multiple systems that can do that. So we can go explore some of those edge cases and edge applications before we commit to making full custom silicon. Now, if you want to see the world's smallest computer, it's actually on display in the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley right now. And what's remarkable is that the entire computer, if you're a golf fan, fits on the tip of a golf tee. Okay. But the punchline to this story is today an entire computer fits into the area that a single bit used in a punch card in Richard Feynman's day. So we're getting there, not quite at the nanotech yet, uh, but we're well on our way and we would encourage people to take a look at what we've put together and uh, see if you can contribute to that ecosystem. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna, maybe I'll, can I move over here? Does that work? All right. Um, so um, I wanna talk about um, openness and um, the role it plays in community building um, and the power of it. And uh, I think it's a very interesting question for everybody, but maybe specifically, specifically for this audience is where do you draw the line of openness? Um, you're probably always gonna have something that's inside the line and that only you know about. Uh, but there's a lot of power in opening up. So a um, little bit history of the company. Um, I started a microprocessor company in 2008. It's great timing, uh, if you remember 2008. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, I think a lot of the challenges I faced at the time has kind of formed the concepts, even inside the technology, uh, to the point that if you have no money, how do you build a chip? and the methodologies that came out of it. If you have a lot of money, you're rich, you don't have as many problems. Um, so over four years, we built four chips. Uh, so over three years, we built four chips. Um, the last one being a 28 nanometer, 64 core chip that did six, uh, 50 gigaflops per watt. So about 20 picojoules per operation. And for those of you who do embedded type stuff, that's a pretty impressive number. Um, and uh, um, we did this with three engineers. And at the time that you know, we said it five million dollars, at the time we pushed the button on the tape out, it was more like two million dollars. So four chips and two million dollars over three years. Worked very hard, but with a tiny team. Um, and felt very good about it, but uh, as I'm gonna show you, it wasn't enough. It really didn't matter what we did. Um, so uh, now we were, we're, we're a parallel processor company, and we're not the first one to do that. There have been literally tens if not hundreds of parallel processor architectures in the, in the last decades. Uh, I'm sure you know some of the companies here or architectures. You have things like the transputer, the cell architecture, and many, many others. And all incredible engineering achievements, you know, with big teams, billions of dollars spent. And uh, at the end of the day, not a single one of them made a sustainable impression um, on, in terms of ecosystem and programmers. Um, you know, one could say that today, the GPU has kind of hit critical mass. Um, and, but of course, that's much thanks to the fact that they have a base of being graphics processor first, and then piggybacking on that uh, to be a, um, a general programmable device. Um, in, in this case, you're kind of coming, trying to bootstrap from nothing. And uh, um, so, we were in the same position as all these companies. Uh, built the chips, now what, right? How do you program it? Uh, how do you get the community to be built up, the, the large group of programmers, so you don't have to program every application from scratch every time? Um, and so my kind of mini epiphany in 2012 was that the old way of doing business in that you know only the paranoid survive, as Andy Grove would say, um, and keep the riffraff out was price it high, get everybody to sign an NDA. So that's what we did. And we had you know, a couple customers, five customers, you know, $50,000 in kits sold, but you know, clearly on, on our way to the grave in terms of startup, uh, um, startup company. And, uh, and then started looking around and saw what other companies and industries were doing. Um, and it's very clear that to, to get a programmable platform to take hold, you have to open up. Yeah, throw, uh, throw away the NDAs, right? You have to publish your data sheet, 
um, publish everything that you can, um, and um, also bring the price point down. Because very few people today have $10,000 to spend um, on an eval kit. So um, looking at some companies that are kind of leaders in, the, uh, in, in doing this, uh, are doing in Raspberry Pi in terms of cost reduction, what happens when you bring it down to $25, right? So people have a choice. Do I you know, go out for a couple of beers or do I buy a computer today? Right? That's a very different choice versus a few years ago. And in our case, it was, well, our kit costs $10,000. All right, well, maybe from next year's budgetary cycle, I can buy one and versus a Raspberry Pi where people put it on their credit card and they move on. So the price point is a huge thing. Um, capital transparency. Um, so um, in 2008 when I was trying to raise money and even really since then, the traditional way is you, you, know, word of, um, you know people, you network, uh, you get in front of an investor, you give them your pitch, um, and you know, if he likes the pitch, if he likes you, he likes the team, the market, uh, you get funded. Um, but it's really point to point. It's it's door to door knocking, and uh, then you have platforms like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, where it's completely transparent. You put up your concept for everybody to see, and people microfund you, not in terms of equity investment, but in terms of product investment. They help you build your product. So that I mean that's revolutionary. That's you know, capital transparency. Um, looking at the Linux, right? Maybe, well, probably the most successful open source project we've seen, um, and they are really setting the standard in terms of massive collaboration on an open, um, an open forum. Um, and so they show openness and collaboration. And then finally, ARM, on the commercial side, how do you build an ecosystem among commercial partners? So it doesn't just have to be hackers and do-it-yourself guys that could participate in the community. How do you make maybe a community of, of, of kill each other competitors work together in an ecosystem for the greater good. Um, so, um, so those are some of the inspirations uh, that drove me forward. Um, and so in, in 2012, we launched this $99 um, quote unquote supercomputer. It's not a supercomputer. If you tie a lot of them together, it's a supercomputer. But $99 for an 18 core computer is, is pretty impressive, right? That's, that's a completely different price point. It's the size of a credit card. Um, and uh, the idea was not just to get our platform out there in as many hands as possible, but also democratize access to parallel computing. Uh, it used to be that to do parallel computing research, you needed to go buy equipment clusters, and there's many people in the world who don't have access to that. Um, probably the most Western universities that are good and well-funded, they have big grants and they have big industrial partnerships. But this was, the idea here was we're going to go global. Um, and, uh, um, so we raised almost a million dollars in 30 days on Kickstarter. Um, and uh, completely open source, open access, down to the chip level. So again, drawing the line in terms of openness, we drew the line at the chip. We didn't see a purpose in opening up the RTL code for our chip, but everything else was open. Uh, there were no binary blob drivers. There was no uh, software licensing. Everything was free and open source, uh, GPL or BSD or MIT licensed. Um, and three years later, we're successfully sell selling this product uh, on a continuous basis at DigiKey, Amazon, and, uh, and we have a community. Um, so if we look at kind of a before and after snapshot of what Openness did for us, before Openness, one foot in the grave, we were going to go out of business. Um, and then afterwards, you know, if we look at some of the metrics, customers grew from five to 10,000. Uh, we, we had one university partner, afterwards 200. Um, site traffic, Twitter, publications. Um, but I think the bottom one is the most positive one. Um, went from you know, less than $50,000 yearly sales to almost $2 million in sales. Um, that's, that's significant. And this all came from taking the scary step of let's publish all our data sheets and documents on the web and let's show people what we have, uh, invite people in to collaborate. Um, so now, in the last three years, a lot of what really I picked up is less about chip design and about community building and how challenging that is. And uh, openness is a, is a necessary but uh, insufficient condition for community building. Community building is very, very hard. And uh, it takes a lot of energy and fuel to, to sustain it. And so you know, one of the key takeaways is if you want to build a really big community, 
um, just like if you want to do a lot of selling, you need to reduce uh, friction and you need to reduce barriers for making that sale or barriers for people to participate. And so um, if you look at something like our, the board that we build, um, um, it's a computer. Uh, and so first hurdle is people have to boot it, right? So do they have the right accessories to do that? Do they have a, uh, a cable to plug it in? Are there a quick start guide? Is there documentation? Um, and as you go down the line, um, the more things you can remove that are complicated, the skills that people don't have, or the patience or time or money that people don't have, the bigger the community. Um, so if you look at the left side, for example, how many people actually have the skills and the money and the time to do their own board design? So we fell on this because uh, initially we launched this computer board, which was interesting, but it would have been a lot more interesting if there were accessory boards with it. My assumption was people want an accessory board, they design their own accessory board, or maybe somebody will build accessory boards for our board. That didn't happen. And so that took away a big part of the community that did not have the skills to do that. Um, there were a few people with those skills, but it was a smaller number. Um, and so what you see is, as you, the more things you can remove as obstacles, your community will grow by 10x by each level, more or less, uh, up to the consumer level. Consumer level is, there is no manual, you plug in the, the, the cables and you're done, right? That's, then you reach into the billions. Um, if you wanna make people build their own boards and write their own software and drivers and everything else, you, there might be 10 people in the world that you can collaborate with. So reducing barriers, every which way you can is huge to making a community grow. So um, in, in conclusion, um, openness is fundamental to building a thriving community uh, and, and doing collaboration. Um, there's really no point in trying unless you're willing to open up. Um, and um, I think that there is a Linux-like movement happening in hardware. Uh, we're still in, it, it's still in its infancy compared to where the software has been since the 80s, uh, but it's happening. And I think it's our responsibility to make it happen faster because the, the pace of innovation as you collaborate thousands of people across the world is that much faster than a bunch of silos working on the same problem uh, all over the place. And one small data point from our side, um, we're prospering very much thanks to the openness and the, the step that we took. Um, and uh, um, that's, my, uh, that's my presentation. Okay, I'll try over here as well. Okay, so we heard from Prabal talking a bit about the challenges of building communities in universities, and then Andreas has just talked a bit about the challenges once you move that into a small company. What I'm gonna talk about today is really how you expand that into a more global organization and ecosystem. Um, so what are we really trying to achieve with an ecosystem? You really want a diverse selection of companies that you can go and pick from the resources that you need to achieve what you need to do. Um, Arm as a company has been around 25 years this year, and we didn't go from nothing to massive ecosystem overnight. This is something that's evolved over many years. Um, the company was formed in 1990 with 12 guys in a barn in Cambridge in the UK. And partnership really grew out of necessity. It was never a heavily invested uh, startup company. Everything was always paying its way. So partnership really evolved out of we didn't have enough money or resources to do it all ourselves. So it's working. How do we leverage the rest of the partners to get to where we need to be? And you know, if you look across all the logos here, and this is just a subset of them, there's literally thousands of people in our ecosystem and this is really the value that the ARM architecture brings together all these diverse interests. And if, if you squint a bit and sort of try and put these into buckets, we have our traditional silicon partners. That's the people we license our processors, GPUs, uh, memory interfaces, and things like that to. They take our IP, they go off and create an SOC, and then sell that onto the equipment manufacturers. So they're, if you like, our traditional um, target customers. We also have a bunch of partners that are really there to facilitate going from IP through to product. So, you know, what are the design tools? What, what tools do you need to verify your design? How do you, how do you get the thing out the door? 
And then the final piece is, um, you know, once you have your silicon, what else do you need? And it comes back to sort of some of the messages echoed earlier is you need the whole system. So you need an operating system, you need drivers, and, and, and there's a whole bunch of partners in that ecosystem that are there to support it. And when you put all this together, it's really, that's how you get from idea to product in, in a system where you bring in uh, components across from a wide part of the ecosystem. So how do you go about doing this? So fundamentally, you have to have a viable business model. You know, money does make the world go round, so having a business model where you understand where everybody in the ecosystem is going to make their money. Um, from an ARM perspective, we're an IP provider. So our business model is we design a processor core or GPU. Um, and then we license that to a semiconductor vendor who then goes off and does an SOC. And in return, they give us a license fee. Typically, we license our IP to a number of partners, and the license fee typically covers the engineering costs for developing it. The SOC vendor eventually produces silicon, and when that ships to the OEM, then we get the royalty. Um, and the royalty is a really critical part of the, of, of the equation because it gives us a vested interest in the success of our end customers. So until they're shipping silicon, we are not, um, we don't get the royalty. So if you go back to the earlier th slide of, you know, why are the other pieces of the ecosystem there? is because everybody's got a vested interest to get the customer to market. The other part of the business model that's really important is uh, design once and reuse. And you know, both from our perspective in that we'd like to design a core and license it to multiple customers, not only in a single market segment, but across market segments. But this also gives our partners in the ecosystem something to target. Um, and so again, you know, software developers, tool developers, they also want to design one thing and target it at multiple um, markets. And the size of the market does matter. And you know, just looking at some of the numbers on the bottom here, currently we've got over 1,000 licensees of our processor cores. And we're currently shipping, last year we shipped 12, 12 billion uh, ARM cores um, in, in 2014. And cumulatively, we're at 50 billion. And so, you know, if you look at the economics of, you know, there may be tiny little uh, microcontrollers and maybe full-on application processors, but this is what really attracts people to the ecosystem is there's enough volume there that if they can get some part of that market, it's sustainable for them. And again, so, so, so then being able to target these common building blocks that are reused across multiple market segments. And so this, this slide really is, you know, so, so we have a business model, so how do we then go about making the whole thing successful? And it's really about creating the playing field. And that's not defining where everything is on the playing field. It's we have to have a way of bringing all our ecosystem partners together. And I think this is echoing some of the comments that Pabal talked about in terms of you, know, you need all the components if you're going to be successful. Um, so from an ARM perspective, We've had an on-chip interconnect pretty much from the very early days called Amber. It's evolved over time. Um, and this is an on-chip interconnect that we defined very early and, and evolved it that allows a standard <coughs> interface to connect into third-party IP. Um, and it, it's fundamentally a free and open standard. Arm as a company controls the standard, but anybody can design to that standard. So that gives uh, our partners are, um, a way of connecting into a, a standard ecosystem. The other part of it is to provide the essential building blocks. So obviously we do CPUs, that's what we're most known for. Uh, and so that's what really drives the ecosystem is having some standardization around the software. And then the third point is really the one that I think is hardest to come to terms with for a lot of companies is that Nobody can do everything anymore. And so I've come to terms with that and encouraging third party IP providers is, is the way to be successful because there's such a diversity out there. You may have good bits in some areas, but there may be other solutions and finding a way where it's a win-win for everybody to come together is really what it's all about. And the other part of it is not to be paranoid about competition. I mean, in our ecosystem, 
We have partners competing with us, and to some extent, what we do and some of our partners do can potentially compete. But at the end of the day, it's all good because it's all in the ARM ecosystem, and we're all uh, moving towards being successful. <clears throat> so the other part of it is, you know, ag again, allowing diversity in the ecosystem. So allowing our partners to, to do different imp implementations. We have a concept of we sell you a core where we give you the RTL, so we've defined the microarchitecture. We also have a method of licensing where we just give you the instruction set and you can go off and do your own microarchitecture. So again, it, it's, it's again giving that flexibility. But the underlying thing that we do enforce very strongly is the software compatibility. We don't want a fragmentation in the software world because then that, the whole ecosystem falls apart when there's no code portability. And the final point is, which is quite interesting um, from, from my perspective is, you know, I've been at ARM for a while, is you know, we are the Switzerland of our partnership. So we don't compete with our customers. We don't sell silicon. And because of that, we don't have a particular vested interest in a particular SOC solution. So it's quite interesting to talk to OEMs where they, you, you'll ask them a question. If they ask a particular customer, they will go and look at what they've got in the cupboard. And the answer will be, whatever they've got in the cupboard is the answer to your question. So if you go to a DSP vendor, you need a DSP, sir. You need a GPU, sir, depending on what's in the cupboard. From our perspective, yeah, we're looking broader than that for the ecosystem. The other interesting challenge is, and again, I think Andreas talked on some of this uh, as well, is, is walking the fine line between differentiation and, and standardization. So. Um, one size doesn't fit all, so having diverse solutions to the same problems, you know, if you look at our partners, and four partners will solve the same problem four different ways. Um, however, we don't want to have to have a software base for each one of those four solutions, so you really need to understand what are the common features that aren't adding value to a particular solution, and then leave room for our partners to innovate. Because if it, if, it, if it devolves into a price war, then that's not really sustainable for the ecosystem. And again, it, this is all self-correcting. And, and this changes over time. So features that are one, uh, where one day are really innovative and differentiating, if they're innovative and differentiating over time, other people will start to do that. And a good example of this is the early smartphone power management was really a, 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 a complex um, problem. And only a few companies really did it well. Now it's a price of entry if you want to be in the smartphone market. And then sort of finishing up on the instruction set is um, the architecture, for the, the envelope is really the instruction set, and we can't afford to have fragmentation. So again, being strict on the architecture. And then just sort of to sort of wrap up. So the other thing that the ecosystem does is drives innovation. And I have, I have this personal theory that all our partners are on a sine wave. There's always some on the way up, and there's always some on the way down. Some go higher, and the frequency changes. Some never get up there, and some have a one-hit wonder, and they're gone. And, and what's interesting is if you look back over the early smartphone days, it's a really good example of this. Um, you know, the, the very earliest smartphones that you could argue was the OMAP-based smartphones. The year after, it was a Snapdragon. So again, very fast pace of of innovation. Then you could argue it was Tegra 2. Then the year after that, there's a whole whole bunch of possibilities. And you know, and as an OEM, you get to pick which one of the waves you want to want, want to actually go and surf. Um, and again, this sort of shows you the typical way the ecosystem evolves. We start off with one or two partners, lays blazing the trail, and then as the ecosystem matures, that's when the rest of the partners pile in. So in summary, um, I think the fundamental concepts here are you know, the realization that nobody can do everything anymore. And it really is about partnership and the business models that go along with partnership. And there are significant volumes and new supply chains that really are available out there to tap. And you know, the question is, how do we bring this into, sort of in, into this community? And as part of working with DARPA, ARM is looking at how we lower the barriers to licensing uh, ARM IP for, for DARPA research and for university research. And, if, and again, so that's, that's one of the things that we're doing to, to enable the goodness of this ecosystem to bleed across into defense. Thank you very much.
Okay, so we're going to transition now to uh, the discussion part of this, and I, I don't want this to just be like a serial interview, so I hope you will uh, interject and jump in when you have an additional uh, comment or, or point that you want to make. Uh, but I want to start things off by uh, posing the following thought experiment, which is that you've uh, just decided to accept an offer to become a program manager at DARPA, uh, and uh, so what what is the program that you would be most excited about pitching and, and why? Uh, so, uh, oh, great. So, uh, when I look at the world, we are starting to collect enormous amounts of data from some of the sensors that we're starting to build, a lot of sensors that are deployed in the world. Um, we've got to start making sense of all of that data, and there's a huge gap between kind of understanding and inference and the volume of data we're collecting. And if you look at where things are going in terms of the cost of storage, right now storage is effectively free, but that is going to run out of steam eventually. So we're gonna to have to be better about um, uh, analyzing data closer to the source, summarizing data, making meaning, and we don't do that very well. So that would be one of the themes I would love to, to help uh, DARPA drive. Great. Um, so I, I, I think there's, uh, Two things that kind of I know to be true that uh, uh, somewhat controversial. Uh, one is, um, you know, Moore's law is coming to an end, right? So we have to start thinking about post Moore's law, and it's coming up quicker than we think. Um, and so, you know, I, I know there are other people working on this as well, but uh, a whole slew of innovation, the architecture side, we just can't ride the the, the process node scaling down and integration uh, and, and scaling out the, the chips. We need to think smarter, so that's, that's one area. And then um, the second one is, I believe that the future of all of computing is massively parallel, uh, and uh, which is apparently also controversial. Uh, one of my idols, Linus Torvald, uh, said you know, in, a, in an online discussion that the f everybody's saying the future is parallel is a bunch of crock, right? That doesn't work. And um, it's, I think it's partially true. Un until today, you saw those billions of dollars of investment there's been a lot of uh, disappointment in the past, um, but uh, you know, current microprocessors are very inefficient. Um, for a lot of problems, they're good enough, but for anything that's leading edge, you know, all you have is energy, right? If you run off a battery, you need to be more efficient, and you know, scaling down below 14 nanometer isn't going to work very well. So um, you need to be more efficient, and that's where the architecture innovation comes in. So I think the uh, yeah, and, and then how to program those devices. Those are kind of two things that I think are interesting for the future. So, so I sort of agree on, with, with Prabal on that one of the areas of the, you know, we like to call it little big data, the, um, you know, the amount of data coming from sensors even in smartphones today and, and being able to deal with that data both on the device and then shipping it back to the cloud. Um, so that's one area that I think is definitely very interesting. The other area is how to reduce the barriers to entry for people wanting to do SOC design. Today it's getting very expensive very quickly. Um, how, do we, how do we use the power of things like the ecosystem and how do we identify what areas of the SOC we can get away with good enough rather than pushing everything to the limit, figure out what's good enough and you inherit an ecosystem versus really focusing on you know, the areas where you can add value and the rest of it, try and leverage what you can from the ecosystem and really lowering the ban barriers so that we get more people involved. Great. Um, what are some of the uh, applications that you're seeing of the platforms that you're working on? So uh, you know, what, what are people using uh, you know, Smart Dust or the parallel computing board that you've developed or I mean, I, I know uh, it's sort of everything for ARM, but if, if you could each talk about a, uh, you know, a couple of applications that you're already seeing and maybe one future-oriented one that would require and motivate uh, further advances in, in, uh, in, in chip technology. Sure. So uh, one of the uh, application areas that my colleagues are exploring uh, is com uh, combining electronics and biology, in particular us, so embedding these sensors in our eyes, so things like interocular pressure sensing or intracranial pressure sensing tell us things about kind of early indicators for 
glaucoma or whether you've got, um, uh, you know, uh, if you've had a concussion, if you're at high risk of, um, you know, uh, secondary effects. But uh, more broadly, I think to answer that question, what I'm envisioning is that this is really enabling technology that we want to get into the hands of a lot of people. So we want to encourage biologists and uh, neurosurgeons and social scientists to interact with the electrical engineers and computer scientists to go imagine that crazy stuff that when computers really are a cubic millimeter in size, you can do. And so I'll be the first to admit, I'm not creative enough to answer that question. I hope the rest of you are. But it's your goal to uh, create the equivalent of a development kit? And, That's right. And, and send it out and get people to, to begin That's exactly right. So instead of having a three-year program that yields one unit at the end of it mm -hmm. that's kind of, you know, spit and bailing wire, mm -hmm. that at the end of three months you have your prototype, and at the end of a three- or five-year program you've done a deployment with tens or hundreds of these devices. Mm -hmm. I think we're getting to the point where that should be our goal. I think, I think that's really the way to go because until you get hardware out in the field, you don't really get the feedback that you need to design the next iteration of hardware. And that's one of the challenges we see is you know, when we put new architecture out, you have a chicken in the egg. There's no, nobody's going to spend the effort to put to the new architecture until it's available and they can see a way of monetizing that. And so having cheap development kits is, is essential to deploying new IP, I think. And and Andreas, what are people what are people doing with the boards, and and does the fact that you've opened up uh, is is that allowing you to get more feedback from users? Oh yeah, I mean you you drinking from a fire hose, right? Mm -hmm. You get feedback all the time, and whether it, you want it or not. Yeah, so <laughs> so a lot of it becomes filtering and uh -huh. clustering, right? And figuring out what's real. I mean, when we launched the Kickstarter in 2012. We did a histogram of all the things that people want to do it, with it, and I would say the majority of the ideas were just bad ideas. Uh, Bitcoin mining, right? Uh, you know, fluid dynamics on a credit card size board uh, and things like that. I mean, all after a while, right, you, you, you know, you, people realize that maybe it wasn't such a good idea. And then the, the good examples come out, uh, and then we invest in that, right? So it's analogous to, you know, you, you throw a bunch of about a seed, you see what grows, and then you nurture that plant that actually grows. So the, the two areas where, where I think people, we made a, an impression is, um, Wireless communication, so software-defined radio, is is a home run, and then um, image processing. Um, so it basically comes back to signal processing, 1D and, and 2D. Um, those, and that's that's kind of our core. Um, and so, yeah, that's you know you could do worse. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that has played a, a really important role in inspiring the next generation of scientists, engineers, and, and entrepreneurs is to have some entry points. So if you talk to a lot of people uh, in science, technology, engineering, and math who are nearing retirement and you say, well, what is it that first got you interested? They'll say, well, I had a chemistry set and I got to blow things up with that. Um, and unfortunately, we've taken all the really interesting uh, chemicals out of our chemistry sets. Uh, but in, in the field of, of uh, semiconductors, are there some things that are like the Heath kit or like uh, you know, the ham radio that can serve as that initial en entry point into the field? So uh, you know, I think things like spark fun are great. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, you mentioned Steve. For, for those people who don't know what spark uh, fun is. So spark, uh, spark fun is a company um, that grew out of uh, a, a student at uh, University, or Colorado, um, CU Boulder, uh, dorm room. He couldn't buy parts that he wanted to build cool stuff, so he decided to buy a bunch of stuff and sell it, you know, from his bedroom. In fact, I had an experience like this when I was an undergrad as well. But uh, SparkFun is essentially a place that makers and DIY folks can go and get components um, without having to build their own circuit boards, and then they can stitch them together and they can use things like the Arduino platform, which is extremely easy to use try stuff out, and there's a lot of tutorials that help people understand this. This is, in a lot of ways, what you're talking about when you, you know, mentioned Steve uh, Jobs' experience growing up. Right? So we had this period uh, where we didn't have stuff that was so easily accessible and people were going off and doing video games, but now a lot of this technology is inexpensive enough, is accessible enough, that it's got a lot of interest. And so I think that is the, you know, the gateway in some sense, mm -hmm. uh, is, is the cool stuff you can do and you can just buy it, spark fun or Radio Shack. And so, uh, so um, yeah, we, ha we have a little bit of history with this idea, too, of, uh, 
of getting people to use it. And uh, I think it's one of the, uh, the frustrating secrets that not many people know is that when you put out a kit like this, 90 to 99% of the kits just sit on the shelf. People don't use it. And the lower the price, the, more, the higher the percentage of the kits that sit on the shelf. And it's true for Arduino, Raspberry Pi, parallel boards. People have the best of intentions, and they still don't have any more time to do it. Uh, and so that, that's been hard. And the, the more complex and powerful the system you provide for them, the probably the higher the hurdle of skills they need to use it. Uh, so yeah, so I, th I don't think the, the parallel board is going to be the entry point where it gets somebody hooked on electronics. It's probably going to be the thing that maybe a high school student or a graduate student will pick up and say, wow, that's, you know, I can go to the next level. Um, I think uh, the Arduino is a great example of, of something that they've brought programming to the masses, right? You, you plug it into the USB port, you have an IDE, and it could not be easier. Um, so. I mean, switching it up a, a bit, if you look at it, what's really happening on the, the whole app store phenomenon, that's really, I think, one of the really interesting entry points for getting people generally interested in programming and sort of coupling that with, with platforms where they can start exposing the hardware. But you know, it's a, it, the barrier to getting into it is low. There is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And, and so that's, I think, a very interesting way of getting people sort of motivated. And that's, I think, if you like, I'm going to stop so squeaking. Let me add a little bit of something to here, uh, which is that people want to do cool stuff, mm -hmm. right? You don't oftentimes show up saying, I want to you know, improve the uh, underlying technology, right? right. So, uh, and so I actually think art is the gateway drug, right? So mm -hmm. people want to do cool stuff. That mm -hmm. is art. And so we should stop talking about STEM and really start talking about STEAM. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so, Andreas, one of the things that you and I were talking about prior to the uh, panel is what's happened to the uh, uh, startup landscape for semiconductor companies. So I, I want you to talk a little bit about what, what you see as the uh, maybe somewhat discouraging trends, uh, but also whether you think there's something that, uh, you know, DARPA or other federal agencies that are funding research could, could do about the situation. Yes, so, so I started in 2008, and uh, the, the bottom start, kind of started to fall out of the semiconductor startup space in 2000 with the fall of the bubble. And then, you know, there was a, a wave that kept going through 2005. There was some funding. But then as those companies started failing after investors had put in $100 million in a bunch of, you know, different companies, anybody who'd ever done that before said, I'm never doing this again. Um, and so today, the, at least the U.S. VC investment is close to zero. Uh, there might be a couple of Series A's a year or something like that. Uh, and so, so, okay, so we have to decide, do we, do we want a, um, a vibrant um, chip software startups or should we just leave it to the, the you know, the chipzillas of the world? And so, um, so but you need some money to, um, to do a startup. Um, and so there's two things, one is, Somebody should take the risk on a startup. If it's not an investor, maybe somebody else like DARPA. And then second one is um, there is the conception, um, misconception that a chip costs $100 million to build, um, which is true if you're building the latest Apple flagship processor, mobile processor. It's not true if you're building something very specific. Um, and so the lower the barrier we can make for chip design, uh, whether it's the tools, the infrastructures, the, the labs, uh, the more startups we can have. Um, I would say that you can, uh, with the right environment, uh, you can do a leading edge chip for a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, which is not that far off from an app startup, right? If you count people's time as salaries, mm -hmm. so you're in the same ballpark. So there's a big difference between a hundred million dollars and a hundred thousand um, dollars. Right, but do you think there's, I, I guess this is a question for all of you, do you think that there's something that, that DARPA could do that would have the impact of the BLSI investment that was made in electronic design automation and MOSIS and things like that. What, what would the 21st century equivalent of that be? So I'm just to continue with it. So yeah. any technology that reduces the cost of designing chips, mm -hmm. uh, that is a huge win for, especially for the small companies, because they can't brute force it with, with huge R&D budgets. And again, sort of building on some of the work already going on in terms of the chiplet work in, in DARPA, you know, identifying the common building blocks so you don't have to redo that, and you can really just focus on the bit where you're adding value and sort of looking at integration technologies. 
So maybe looking, uh, so maybe looking at this question from a slightly different perspective, which is, what would it take for a motivated high school student or college student who isn't in a VLSI design course to actually spin a chip? You know, what are the tools? What are the costs? And how do you get that down to a point where somebody could actually do it? And, and, and what are the barriers to making that happen? So if you could figure out how to make that happen, and, and the entire ecosystem plays a role in this, everything from you know, the tools, and, and sure, you could lay out stuff in magic uh, like they did 20, 30 years ago, but you know, can we get modern tools? Can we enable this ecosystem? I think that might help us mm -hmm. if people could do it. Uh, Nigel, do you want to talk a little bit about what uh, ARM's level of collaboration has been so far with academia and what you're thinking about for the future? So, so we have a few, in the past we've had a few, few close relationships, one of them with the University of Michigan. Um, and as we've sort of scaled out the organization, you know, we've, we've realized that it is quite difficult to deal with us from a, a legal and, and academic perspective. So um, we're in the process of rolling out a program that will make it much easier for people to gain access to RMIP, um, both from a research, from an academic, academic perspective and also through, through DARPA, have a common framework for people to be able to get uh, access to RMIP. If I stop squeaking. Um, and, and really, you know, at, at both low cost from a legal perspective and low cost from financial perspective as well. Great. Um, so I want to give each of the panelists uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, mention one last thing that hasn't been covered so far in, in their remarks, particularly if there's a, uh, something about you know, a, uh, high quality free advice for the federal government uh, associated with it. So you want to go first? Uh, well, I can end. <laughs> go last. Okay. All right, I'm okay. I mean, I think one of the things I would say is Partnership is a very, very, very powerful um, model, and I would, I would say, look at where we are today and how do we build more of a par partnership ecosystem in the defence community, and you know, figure out where good enough is actually good enough, rather than having to push the envelope in all directions. Is this potential to to leverage things, and any point at which you can leverage something that's commercially viable, it's a cost saving as well as time to market advantage. Um, so, I, w I would definitely uh, um, advise everybody to kind of uh, dip, their dip their toe in the water of collaboration. So if you've never heard of GitHub uh, or platforms like that, uh, get an account uh, and, uh, and you know, start contributing to projects, learn the process, uh, how to do pull requests and things like that. Um, it's, uh, there's a, an enormous power and a lack of skill in certain areas today that uh, I think uh, a lot of people within the government have. Uh, for example, in, in our case, we, uh, we realized that there was no open source uh, DSP library, a vectorized DSP library that we could use that fit our needs. Uh, there's been efforts in the past. Um, maybe there's whole libraries in this room that, that could be open sourced for the benefit of everybody else. And so we had to bootstrap something. Um, and uh, so what we did is we, uh, we put up an architecture on GitHub, uh, so with a license called Apache, and um, we invited people uh, from the community, uh, and um, from our 10,000 person community, and we said, look, we'll, we'll, um, for every function, every C function that you contribute, you get a free parallel board. And within uh, two weeks, we had 35 collaborators. So our, our t software team grew from you know, two people to 35 people in, in, in a matter of a couple of weeks. And, uh, and that could not have happened without one collaboration platform and, uh, um, and you know, two, the right framework, the right license and things like that. So, um, and that's continuing uh, onwards. So I, I think, um, yeah, um, drawing the line and saying, look, this is all low level stuff. Uh, everybody needs a, you know, a DSP library, a C library. Uh, no point in having a hundred of them sitting in silos everywhere. Let's just pool our resources, like we did in the past with Linux, with GCC, with GDB, and all these other platforms. I think there's endless opportunities for step and repeat for this model. And and so your parallel boards were the equivalent of uh, pizza for graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> Free pizza. Yeah. So. Uh, 
you know, there's an enormous amount of research that never sees the light of day, uh, you know, in a grad student's home directory, um, or, uh, you know, maybe it's in GitHub, but it's in a condition that's completely unusable. And there are perfectly good reasons for this. The research enterprise oftentimes is not incentivized to produce reusable technology. We're incentivized to demonstrate novel concepts. And yet, for adoption more broadly, you need something that's a little bit more finished than that. And there is this gap, then, between research and industry. And the government could play a better role in helping us package the research that isn't what grad students should necessarily be doing, mm -hmm. but would be usable to a much larger fraction of society. So that's an area I think the government could invest more in, is the translational piece, without necessarily knowing that there's a specific application you have in mind. So you enable a lot of folks to, to build on the work that's been done in academia without burdening the students who have to get their PhDs. And are, are there some examples about how that has been done in the past? So, I mean, obviously one thing that uh, DARPA has started recently is something called the Open Catalog. Mm -hmm. So they're certainly making it easier for uh, uh, people to find the publications and the, and, and the open source software and uh, really making the default openness for, uh, for a large number of the research projects? Uh, so uh, things like that are great. There are, of course, IP issues sometimes mm -hmm. that people have to navigate. Um, but you can still make open source software that has you know, IP protection in there. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the problem that I'm actually pointing at is a little deeper than that, where it's that the stuff just doesn't quite work except in the one case that the student right. got it to work. And so investing in the people um, in, you know, in sort of the translation of that, uh, that's going to require a little bit of different thinking. So that might in involve maybe embedding folks in the labs for a while that are trying to move the technology uh, and, and make it more usable. But how, how much of that is related to the metrics of success in academia being publishing at the next conference, well, publishing at the next conference? It's not if that's your metric, and, and that's part of the problem. But if yeah. your metric is impact, right? If your metric is having your technology actually make a difference in the world. So I would argue that part of our problem is that we have the wrong set of metrics yep. in much of academia. You shouldn't just be focused on writing the next paper. Sure, that'll be great. So you get really high citation counts and paper counts. But if you really want to make a difference, invest the extra. So I personally do this. I try to force a lot of our stuff out the door. But it's not something um, a lot of my colleagues share, and I get a lot of flack for it. As a community, we could be better about trying to do that. And if, if there's probably maybe one thing that the government can affect here is writing the rules. Right. So as a, as a company, when we do a chip for somebody, um, usually whoever the customer owns the chip, owns the IP. And, uh, and sometimes you're lucky and you get to own your own IP and, and stay, keep ownership. Um, but uh, certainly, you know, whoever, go, you know, whoever pays makes the rules. And, uh, one requirement could be you have to release source code. Right. Uh, you know, so. it's you can't keep the proprietary. Right. Um, so. Okay. Well, that was a great panel. Uh, so uh, please join me in, in thanking our terrific panelists. <laughs>